2020 may have been an absolute dumpster fire of a year, but at least we had some incredible animation premiere to get us through it. Today, we're going to be running you through our picks for the top shows of the year, and hopefully, we'll share some gems that you might have missed out on. Hit that subscribe button and bell and get ready to rate them along with us. I'm Chris Carr. Here are the new animated shows of 2020 ranked. Before we dive in, I want to give a shout out to all of our donors on Patreon, especially our super nerd sponsors of the day, Axel and Aries. Thanks to heroes like them, I get to keep talking tunes with y'all. So thank you so much. Now, I'm going to do my best to keep things vague, but just to be safe, please know that we could wander into some spoilery territory with a few of my notes or some of the visuals we use. So if you don't want to know a darn thing about a show that happened this year, maybe wait on this video till you catch up on everything. Now, for the purposes of this list, we won't be factoring tunes made for those eight and below. It's a bit apples and oranges trying to compare a PBS educational show to a doll aimed political satire. That said, our shows run the gamut of genres and demographics. So with all that out of the way, let's get to ranking. Number 32, Hoops. In our last place slot is Netflix's animated show, Hoops. The main character, Ben, a high school basketball coach, is just so incredibly unlikable. And honestly, we've had shows thrive with an unlikable lead. I mean, Bojack was a complete narcissist. But we root for him to change. We find his world compelling. And as amazing as Jake Johnson is, Ben doesn't have anything that feels really redeeming. It's a crash show filled with meltdowns, dirtbag moves, daddy issues, and void of laughs. With a voice cast this incredible attached, Hoops was a real letdown. Number 31, Thundercats Roar. Sometimes you try something different and it works. And other times, it really doesn't. Many fans were apprehensive about the direction Thundercats Roar was going when the reboot of the franchise was first announced, and they had those fears confirmed when the show aired. While it uses the Thundercats IP, this is a very different series. From the more kiddie animation style and emphasis on wacky shenanigans, this was kind of the Teen Titans Go equivalent of Thundercats. And hey, maybe that's your cup of tea. But for most, this series left a bad taste in diehard Thundercats fans' mouths. Number 30. Crossing Swords. Crossing Swords is a stop-motion animation series that's set in medieval times. Now, I think why most people have a hard time with this one is because it's basically the happy time murders of stop-motion animation. It is wildly inappropriate and crass. And if you aren't prepared for that, you aren't going to enjoy this. I mean, look, the Playmobil aesthetic did not prepare me for this, and I'm not exactly prissy, y'all. I work here. The humor feels reminiscent of early Family Guy, South Park, and Robot Chicken, so this just didn't feel as fresh as other 2020 offerings. The voice cast is bananas on this one, though, and I do think it's worth giving it a few episodes to see if you dig it. Once I got three or four in, I was less shell-shocked, and enjoyed the bits of actual story delivered between all those semen jokes. Number 29. Yabba Dabba Dinosaurs. Yabba Dabba Dinosaurs focuses on Pebbles, Bam Bam, and Dino. Before the show was even released, images made audiences nervous. Dino was shown dabbing, and the internet collectively cringed. The actual released product? Mm, pretty lackluster. The Flintstones was an all-ages show, and honestly skewed towards an older audience prior to the kiddos coming on the scene. It was an animated sitcom the whole family could sit down to watch. This just feels like your generic kids being little scamp sort of situation with familiar IP. The original series is already on HBO Max, so if y'all want the Flintstones, you might as well watch the real thing instead. Number 28. The Mighty Ones. The Mighty Ones dropped just in November, and it's about four pieces of garden litter. So move over, Pixar. Other folks are featuring trash come to life. It's definitely quirky and colorful, but it just doesn't deliver the laughs like other animated series on this list do. It'll keep the kiddos' attention, but other than serving as a 22-minute babysitter, the show really doesn't do much else. Number 27, YOLO Crystal Fantasy. YOLO Crystal Fantasy follows two Australian party girls who are all about good vibes, good times, and horoscopes. This is another show that is definitely not for everyone. The sort of crude look, the style of humor, it's garnered some mixed reviews. And while our protagonists, Rachel and Sarah, aren't the most unique leads, we definitely root for them and their friendship. Plus, supporting shows from indie creators just ensures we continue to hear from new voices. Watch it and let me know what you think. Number 26, It's Pony. A normal girl with an extraordinary best friend, a talking horse. This optimistic girl talking pony buddy cartoon found its way to Nickelodeon earlier this year. The show was met with an overwhelmingly positive response from viewers, and a second 20 episode season has already been ordered. Pony is the strongest character in the series, so I'm hoping season two will flesh out the supporting cast a bit more. Number 25, Ollie's Pack. This Nicktoon premiered in April of this year and follows 13 year old Ollie, who, with the help of his friends Chloe and Bernie, and a monster expert named Captain Wowski, protects a backpack with a portal to the world of monsters. It's cute. And you know me, I love me a good Monster of the Week sort of setup. Personally, I think Cleo and Bernie in particular shine in this show. Number 24, Tig and Seek. Tig and Seek follows Tiggy and his cat while they work in the Department of Lost and Found through 10 12-minute episodes. Tiggy is supposedly eight, but speaks like an adult, and is a full-time worker, 
and the show is equally goofy with no morality tales or lessons learned emphasized here. The supporting cast includes Wanda Sykes and Jermaine Clement, which is an absolute treat. It's cute enough to entice kids while still slightly playing to an older audience. Number 23, The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse. The Wonderful World of Mickey Mouse delivers that nostalgia I think we all really were seeking this year. We needed familiar, and the mouse delivered, but with a hefty dose of self-aware jokes and quirky humor that we don't always see from classic Disney. My biggest issue with this series really just comes down to how Goofy is drawn. There is something really unsettling about him. Maybe it's because I'm a goof troop kid, and I'm used to him looking a very specific way. But I feel like his retro look doesn't feel reminiscent of any incarnation I've ever seen of him before. Number 22, Duncanville. Did we need another animated sitcom about a white working class family on Fox? Probably not, but Fox likes a formula and they stick with it hard. Now, Duncanville has the potential to be something really fun, but this one starts off a little slow. Give it some time, it really gets going. If they keep mining this Amy Poehler-led series, this one could be a real gem. Number 21, Tuning Out the News. Tuning Out the News is an animated news satire show produced by Stephen Colbert. Parody and satire are meant to heighten the absurdity of situations. But, and I don't know if you're aware of this, the world is friggin' bonkers right now. How do you play on absurdity when the whole world is already absurd? I will say, this show is sharp, and the footage used of real people is expertly used to highlight how wild things are right now. Unfortunately, I think this one may get lost in all the bananas ass stuff that's happening on actual news programs. Number 20, Magical Girl Friendship Squad. A red panda bestows magical abilities on two directionless millennials, allowing them to become superheroes. Despite the name Magical Girl Friendship Squad, we don't get a lot of magical girl lore or world building. I mean, we do get the whole Friendship Squad thing in spades, as this really is a show about friendship with a heavy anime influence. The millennial jokes feel a bit stale at times, but the characters are so charming that you let it slide. As a huge Magical Girl stand, though, I just want more of what the name promises me. Number 19, J.J. Villard's Fairy Tales. Full disclosure, y'all, I am not a horror fan. Don't like getting spooked. So when I'm told a show is steeped in the horror genre, I just don't think it's gonna be for me. But I can objectively say that J.J. Villard's Fairy Tales is a weird, ambitiously experimental show that delves into how dark fairy tales are. It's a true love letter to horror. I mean, even the music is a sort of nod to the work of Stanley Kubrick, there's subliminal messages, and there's hidden jump scares throughout the series. Also, I just want to take a minute to add that Adult Swim has become such a rad breeding ground for innovative series. I know there's always going to be sort of this lens of, oh, all well, the adult hashtag so random weird stuff goes there. But man, they have been doing some awesome stuff that I think really gets overlooked. Now, personal preferences coming into play here, you guys. This one for sure is not something I can binge just because of my own personal taste and the fact that I am a massive scaredy cat. But despite how visceral and gross the show can get, I would encourage even wimps like me to give this one a go. Number 18. Cleopatra in Space. Cleopatra in Space gives us an imperfect, plucky heroine and a space setting infused with ancient Egyptian influence. While this doesn't exactly break the mold plot-wise, Cleo is the chosen one for a prophecy, and she must learn to live up to her potential, it does all of the tropes that come with such a storyline really well. The approach here is much more one-off adventure, and it feels like it's giving us some breadcrumbs to follow on a bigger plot, a la Gravity Falls. It's a fun romp, and hopefully will continue to expand on both its prophecy and its world building. Number 17, Transformers, War for Cybertron Trilogy, Siege. Am I about to say a Transformer series has nuance? I know guys, I'm just as surprised as you are. This isn't the Michael Bay fair you're used to. It actually really looks at the clashing ideologies of the Autobots and Decepticons, and it isn't this black and white good versus evil story we've been given time after time. I was genuinely surprised by how compelling these episodes were. They left me wanting more. Number 16, Jurassic World, Camp Cretaceous. The first season of the animated spinoff was set during the events of 2015's Jurassic World, when all the dinos busted free from their cages. Teens attending the Camp Cretaceous summer camp had to fight for their survival in the jungle. This is basically a more kid-friendly Jurassic Park. But don't let that deter you. There are some real scares and tense moments. The dino animation is fabulous, while the kid animation can look a bit stilted and lack the same texture and detail that went into the dinosaurs. But hey, I mean, invest where you should, right? That being said, the story is actually really great. The focus on friendship is nice, and every team gets their sort of moment in the sun. Should you expect something new and bold here? Nah, 
Why do people keep coming to this freaking island? What parent sends their kid here? Ugh. But the teens are much more sympathetic victims than the scientists and adults we usually follow as they're terrorized by the life that has found a way. The new season is set to drop on January 22nd, 2021. Number 15, The Fungies. Set in prehistoric fungi town, the fungies follow Seth, who loves science and often stirs up trouble in town with his friends. This show boasts a beautiful world, typical cartoon shenanigans, but it delivers this absurdism older viewers want from their cartoons. It's cute. Characters are surprisingly complex. And that theme song is catchy as all get out. Number 14, Looney Tunes for HBO Max. Okay, first and foremost, can we talk about these gorgeous backgrounds? These were hand drawn and they're so very reminiscent of the original Looney Tunes. I will say though, there is something a bit hinky about the characters themselves. They just seem, I don't know, slightly off. Maybe that's just the animation program. That being said, the voices here are done fantastically. Eric Bowser proves to be a solid Mel Blanc replacement and our characters sound so much like how we expect our rascally rabbit and crew to sound. The show nails that slapstick humor and feels like you're watching the animation juggernaut of yesteryear that we all revere so much. There isn't anything particularly new about Looney Tunes, but I think that's the point. This is you going back and visiting your old pals. Nothing wrong with that. That's the sort of comfort I think a lot of us needed this year. Number 13, Blood of Zeus. Now, Blood of Zeus had a really rad premise. Zeus fosters yet another bastard son and enrages his wife Hera, who seeks to destroy Zeus's mistress and son, all while giants and demons are on the rise in the mortal world. However, this show just doesn't really hit its stride until you're about four episodes into the series, the halfway point. There were also just some pacing issues. You know, we'd have these epic battles and then it'd still drag somewhere else when filling us in in backstory. The animation is incredible. The character designs are fantastic reimaginings of gods and the violence is really intense in this one, you guys. I mean, this is the same studio that brought us Castlevania. Hopefully seasons to come on this series will just tell tighter stories. Number 12, Onyx Equinox. <laughs> okay, speaking of violence, this one just premiered in November of 2020 on Crunchyroll. So there's a solid chance you missed out on this epic reworking of the mythologies of Mesoamerica. The series centers on an Aztec boy named Izel, who winds up smack dab in a smackdown amongst the gods. In order to save mankind, he must complete an impossible task, closing the five gates to the underworld. This show is basically Aztec Avatar and it is brutal. We're talking some intense graphic violence. And that story is Fascinating. The exploration of these gods is incredibly compelling and the aesthetic is fantastic. Once again though, y'all, if Castlevania level gore isn't your thing, this one might not be for you. Number 11, Lofi, Bobby Moynihan as a weed dealing single dad manatee. That's all you need to know about this series, really. SNL alums and comedy legends round out the vocal cast. The animation is hysterical and weird. <sighs> this one's just fried comedy gold. It's just something fun, funny, and stupid that I flew through. Loved it. Number 10, Star Trek Lower Decks. The final season of Star Trek The Next Generation featured an episode titled Lower Decks, which was told from the perspective of junior officers aboard the Enterprise who viewed our heroes as their demanding and oftentimes crummy bosses. And that's what Lower Decks sort of aims to be, a Star Trek story, but with some fresh eyes, or at least tales from those we don't always hear from since they aren't top brass. The show follows this team that bravely goes where, well, at least one crew has gone before, since this ragtag bunch of Starfleet crew members specialize in second contact. It truly is a love letter to the franchise as a whole. And the voice acting and the animated acting is really lovely and nuanced, so well done. But I completely can understand the criticisms on this one. If you aren't into Trek, it isn't particularly accessible. And if you are into sci-fi and expect genre lampooning, you're not fully getting that either. Number nine, Wizards, Tales of Arcadia. Wizards brings together the stories of Troll Hunter and Three Below, continuing the Chronicles of Arcadia. One of my favorite things about these series is that our characters have been in the background or featured. We had our Three Below stars get their own sort of backdoor pilot in Troll Hunter, and likewise, our hero Hisirdu can be seen in Three Below prior to his familiar Archie setting up the next installment in the franchise. All of the shows within the world of Arcadia do a really great job of exploring family dynamics with chosen families. We've got Jim's relationship with Blinky, Krell and Aja's relationship with Vex, and Wizards follows in suit with Duxie and Merlin. Guys, it'll make you misty-eyed. Now, would I recommend jumping straight into Wizards without the other shows? Eh, not really. You'd be able to catch on to what's occurring, but why start some 80 episodes behind? 
This one, though, hits all the right notes for me. We've got magic, we've got time travel, we've got Athorian lore galore, and it's all packed into just 10 episodes. What's amazing is that this series doesn't feel rushed. 10 is the perfect number, and it keeps wizards from suffering the dreaded Netflix bloat that other series have. It's a brilliant end to the Tales of Arcadia shows, and it has me hyped as heck for the upcoming Troll Hunter feature film. Could Kral and Jim have been better utilized? Eh, perhaps. But I assume they'll get their fair share of screen time, Jim in particular, in the movie. Number 8. Central Park I love this little series that centers on the Tillman family and all the weird people who breeze in and out of Central Park. Having it only available on Apple TV I know is sort of a ding against it, but Central Park is a tremendously charming show. The cast is made up of Broadway heavy hitters, and Stanley Tucci is a real treat. The show's biggest issue, frankly, was that Molly, a biracial teen, who we spent a lot of time learning about her struggle with being biracial, was voiced by Kristen Bell. But the series has resolved that, so I am stoked for more musical numbers from the folks behind Bob's Burgers. Give me more Central Park! Number 7. Solar Opposites Solar Opposites is like if you threw Rick and Morty, Simpsons, Third Rock from the Sun, and Invader Zim in a blender. The show follows aliens who have fled to Earth with a pupa who will eventually grow to terraform the planet. At its core, Solar Opposites is a fish-out-of-water family sitcom by Justin Roiland, co-creator of Rick and Morty. While it blends with Rick and Morty's sensibilities at times, it truly does feel like a show produced by Fox Animation, referencing and reveling in pop culture more like a family guy or American dad. The true gem of the series is its wall subplot. Very rarely do you see a C-plot actively derail and shine brighter than the rest of the show, and it's honestly worth the watch on its own. Number 6. Midnight Gospel The experimental series fixates on Clancy and his universe simulator as he basically does a cosmic podcast. For me, the season finale is one of the most moving pieces of television to be created. It features recordings from the creator's late mother in her final stages of battling cancer. It's a lot heavier than most other shows on this list, and sort of exists on its own spiritual plane. I do think it's a shame most people dismiss this as simply stoner fodder because of the psychedelic aesthetics, because there's some real depth and beauty here. These are real conversations that have been animated over to shift the narrative, but they're still real, and it catches you off guard with how profound it can be. I will say, the binge approach, at least for me, doesn't work for this one. You gotta think these episodes over. Let them breathe. Midnight Gospel ended up being a pretty polarizing show. Some folks seemed to love it, others hated it. So be sure to let me know where you stand on this one. Number 5. Glitch Techs Okay, cards on the table, y'all. We slept on this one, too. We were covering Infinity Train and BoJack! We're a team of four! But we did get to go back and check this one out. Gosh, if you are a gamer, this one is absolutely for you! Glitch Techs follows teens Miko and High Five who work at a game store, which is really just a front for their actual gig, hunting down glitched game bosses who have escaped to the real world. It boasts a diverse cast, a vibrant aesthetic that really reminds me of Wakfu, and hey, it's a completely original concept! That's a pretty big deal on Netflix, where the majority of animated series they've put out have been standing on the shoulders of existing IP. The second season ended with a bit of a cliffhanger mystery. So, it looks like the series should be getting a third season in 2021. Number 4. Close Enough Close Enough manages to blend the absolutely absurd with completely relatable moments. Adulting's hard, y'all. And Close Enough capitalizes on that very real struggle. Close Enough shares the familiar regular show aesthetic and its sense of humor, which works. But it also unfortunately follows RS's episode structure, making each episode contain two 11-minute stories. I personally feel that the show would sing if these stories got their full 22 minutes to really explore a lot of the headier themes it seems to want to talk about. I also know full well that connecting strongly to this show shows my age and demographic. I am this weird adult struggling out in LA. Most of the other married couples I know have or have had roommates live with them. The show's specificity is its strength, so why not really lean into it for the length it deserves? With that change, I think this show could be up there with BoJack in terms of storytelling and character development. Number 3. Animaniacs I know, I know, I already talked about being absurd in 2020, and reboots are symptomatic of a fundamental lack of originality in Hollywood. But man! This was a surprisingly fresh blend of nostalgia and modern modern-day satire. The Animaniacs reboot is just what we needed in 2020. I have an entire video dedicated to how much I loved this reboot, so I won't wax too poetic here. But in a time when the real world was already wildly absurd, it was nice to return to these zany characters. It was comforting to know that Brain was still trying to take over the world, and that the Warner siblings were just as sharp as ever, still taking shots at movie studios, pop culture, and politics. This series is a point in favor of reboots, so long as you pay homage to what you must and update what's necessary. Number 2. Kipo Kipo tells the story of a teen girl who's lived her whole life underground in a burrow with other humans due to the world above's creatures and wildlife mutating. But 
When a mute busts apart her home, Kipo is thrust into the outside world and must adapt. She befriends and meets other humans and mutes along the way, and tries to bring these worlds together as she learns her special connection to the world above and the world below. At the heart of the show is the theme of celebrating differences and forming friendships with those who live life differently than we do. It's beautiful, and I 100% sob during the finale. Having Kipo around for just this year, though, ah, it's bittersweet. I adored this series, and I really wanted more of it. I want more time in this world. I also feel like we could have used another season, or at least used more episodes. We had so much time to learn of Hugo's past and sympathize with him, yet Dr. Amelia remained completely unsympathetic and hard to even understand. Now, does every villain need to be a highly nuanced and relatable being? No, but it does make for a more compelling character. There was just so much this final season needed to cover, and it felt rushed, and I'm not sure that that jump at the ending was completely earned. And finally, in our number one spot, The Owl House. This animated series from Disney tells the story of Luz, a human teen who stumbled into a world filled with magic, witches, and demons. This show personally took a while for me to get into, but once Luz started actually training and attending magic school, oh, I became so invested in her journey, as well as the other characters. We have epic witch battles that are beautifully animated and flow in a way that's usually saved for anime. These sequences are breathtaking and will have you on the edge of your seat. We have the wisecracking antics of Ida, the adorableness of King, plus a rich lore that's slowly unfolding setting us up for an epic second season and so much more magic to delve into. And, of course, there's the blossoming romance between Amity and Luz. This is a massive step in queer representation from Disney. I mean, just the fact that we've blatantly seen this attraction. The House of Mouse is known for placing gay romance in the background, so this is a move in the right direction. A move that I personally feel was probably influenced by the success of shows like She-Ra and Steven Universe. In a post-Harry Potter world, the Owl House loves taking shots at the ridiculous magical MacGuffins we've come to accept. Like, why you'd play any sport that has some sort of weird thing you catch and automatically win, thus negating every other player's efforts. That being said, the show also depicts the deep love a fan has for their fandom, and that you should embrace that, even if other people think you're weird because of it. So how could I not put a series about loving things unabashedly at the top of my list? Whether it's what you love, or who you love, the Owl House assures you that that's okay. This is one that definitely needs to be on your watch list. Now, of course, guys, you know this is just my ranking list. What I want to know is what were your top new tunes of 2020? Hit me with your hot takes in the comments below. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and be sure to check out our other cartoon content. Thank you again to all of our donors on Patreon, especially you, Axel and Aries, and thank you guys for watching. Until next time, I'll see you, Space Cowboy.